Hello, my name is Dr Naveen Sharma and I'm a general and cardiothoracic radiology consultant based in the UK. You may know me from the Radiologist page Twitter and Instagram accounts and I'd really like to thank Radiopedia for inviting me to come and speak. I'm going to go through anterior mediastinal masses, helping you go past just knowing about the four T's, including everything from recognising these things on chest x-ray, knowing how to differentiate lesions on CT and MRI, and also knowing what to recommend when you do find these things on a CT. So here we go. So what are we going to talk about? We'll have a look at how to pick up an anterior mediastinal lesion on a frontal chest x-ray. We'll also have a look at the main causes of an anterior mediastinal mass and go through exactly what they look like on CT and MRI. Do all anterior mediastinal masses need a biopsy? We'll have a look at this question soon. So firstly, how do we define the anterior mediastinum? It's important to recognise that there are different classification systems with the more traditional models using the lateral chest x-ray. The legend of chest radiology that is Felsen described a commonly used model based on three compartments, the anterior, middle and posterior mediastinum. The anterior mediastinum is bounded anteriorly by the sternum and posteriorly by a line drawn from the anterior trachea along the posterior heart border. There are several other models, all using slightly different terms. Some models use a fourth compartment, the superior mediastinum. However, the weakness of using the superior mediastinum is that there is no real clear distinction between the superior and the inferior compartments, and lesions are less likely to respect fascial planes. The other issue is that these days, these lesions are commonly assessed with CT rather than X-ray, and using the traditional models, these mediastinal lesions become a little more tricky to classify. ITMIG, or the International Thymic Malignancy Interest Group, developed a well-used classification system, but this time naming the compartments prevascular, visceral and paravertebral, which are now more relevant to CT imaging. The prevascular compartment is bounded laterally by the parietal pleura and the internal thoracic vessels, anteriorly by the sternum and posteriorly by the pericardium, ascending aorta and aortic arch. It contains fat, lymph nodes and our old friend, the thymus. Why is it important to define these areas? Well, as a radiologist, knowing you have an anterior mediastinal or prevascular mass, this really lets you hone in on the diagnosis. And there's only really a subset of diagnoses you're going to make when your lesion is predominantly prevascular. So how do these lesions get picked up? Some causes of anterior mediastinal masses commonly present with symptoms, in particular some types of lymphoma and germ cell tumour, and sometimes these symptoms can be rapid. However, with thymic lesions, or for example, a retrosternal thyroid goiter, these can be completely asymptomatic. On chest x-ray, these can be particularly subtle, which means we always need to be on the lookout for these lesions, as the clinical indication may not tell us anything to give us a clue. Also important to realise that anterior mediastinal lesions in some circumstances can be screened for. We'll come on to my senior gravis, but these patients will often have a CT or MRI diagnosis looking for thymic lesions. So how do we recognise an anterior mediastinal lesion on a chest x-ray? Here we have an x-ray of a male in his 50s with a two-month history of a hoarse voice. With a hoarse voice, we need to think about the course of the recurrent laryngeal nerves and look at the mediastinum, and in particular, the aortopulmonary or the AP window. Here, we have a subtle density overlying the AP window. This is the aorta, and this is the pulmonary trunk, forming a concavity, which is normal. However, there's an extra contour just here, which is difficult to explain. Once we go over to the CT, there are actually multiple findings here. Firstly, we've got a nodule in the left lobe of the thyroid gland. And if we go up a little bit, we'll see that there's actually some calcified lymph nodes within the lower cervical region. We can see one just over here. Now, these nodes were biopsied and the thyroid nodule was aspirated, showing a papillary carcinoma. However, this doesn't explain the lesion at the AP window. That actually correlates with a lobulated prevascular mass. Around the aorta, we've lost a fat plane and it's difficult to tell whether this is a continuation of the mass or some fluid within a pericardial recess. Important things about the mass are that it's homogeneous with no cystic areas and no calcification and no fat density. There's a third finding on here as well. If we go further down, we can see there's a simple cystic region within the right cardiophrenic angle. So there's a lot going on in this scan. 
Let's focus in on the prevascular lesion. A lobulated homogeneous mass in a patient over 40, statistically, this is most likely to be a thymoma, which was confirmed with a CT guided biopsy. Secondly, we have what was confirmed as a thyroid cancer. And thirdly, we have an incidental simple cyst at the right cardiophrenic angle, which has the classic appearance of a pericardial cyst. If we go back to the chest x-ray, firstly, we'll just appreciate how subtle the anterior mediastinal mass can be on a chest x-ray. Secondly, even more difficult to spot is the pericardial cyst, but the clue here is the difference in density between the right and the left side of the heart. And you can just about make out the right atrial contour here. Here we have another similar case with a subtle density, again, overlying the aortopulmonary window, this time in a female in her 30s. Here the CT shows a more ill-defined prevascular mass, which this time invades the sternum and the chest wall. This one is a case of lymphoma. I just want to point out the difference between a density overlying and obliterating the AP window. On the left, we have our case with a prevascular mass in front of the aorta and palmy trunk, meaning we retain the contour of both. On the right, we have a case of a right-sided hyalur lung cancer, again with an AP window abnormality, but this time we can't make out the aorta or pulmonary trunk, telling us that rather than the prevascular compartment, there is likely something in the visceral compartment. Lo and behold, on the CT, we can see enlarged AP window lymph nodes, which are contralateral nodes in the context of a right-sided lung cancer. So the key learning point here is that an abnormal contour overlying the mediastinum or hilum means there is no loss of silhouette sign, and this may represent a prevascular mass. These can be very subtle, so we need to be looking out for them. On to another case, and this time we have a right-sided abnormality with an abnormal contour on the right side of the mediastinum. With any large mass on the chest x-ray, we need to be thinking about primary lung cancer. However, there is a sign on here that points us away from that. If we look through the mass, we can see hyla vessels, which again tells us the lesion does not abut the hilum and therefore likely lies with the anterior or the posterior mediastinum. Given the morphology and statistically, the anterior mediastinum is more, more likely. This can be thought of as the hilum overlay sign. Let's have a look at the CT in this case, and this shows a well-defined right-sided prevascular mass with a little bit of heterogeneity in terms of contrast enhancement. We can see in the right-sided upper paratracheal region, there is a separate lymph node, which pointed towards a possible diagnosis of lymphoma. This was a patient, a female patient in their 30s, and this was confirmed on a CT-guided biopsy of the main prevascular mass. On to the next question. What are the common anterior mediastinal masses? Here we have the usual suspects of the four Ts. Now, some like to include thoracic aortic aneurysm in the list and make it five Ts. However, as this is technically not a true mass, as such, we won't be including this in this talk. So here we have thymic lesions, thyroid goiter, terrible lymphoma, admittedly a bit sketchy on that one, teratoma and other germ cell tumors. That covers the majority of prevascular masses that you will come across. There are more rare ones, and we'll just mention there is another category of fat-containing mediastinal lesions that we will come on to. So firstly, we'll tackle thymic lesions. What does a normal thymus look like? The thymus is a lymphoid organ in the anterior mediastinum that plays a role in the maturation of T-cells. It's proportionally large after birth and reaches its maximum size at puberty before undergoing involution. It's normally seen on CT as a bilobe triangular structure, most commonly seen anterior to the ascending aorta and pulmonary outflow tract. It's important to know that we shouldn't be seeing much after the age of 20. Anything more than a maximum thickness of 15 millimeters on CT at this point is likely to be abnormal. On this case, just notice how we retain that triangular shape. Which takes us on to thymic abnormalities. So the first point on thymomas, which you've touched on before, Although they're uncommon, they are actually the most common anterior mediastinal mass. If you see a homogeneous or slightly heterogeneous mass in a patient over the age of 40, it's most likely to be a thymoma. It's useful to think of thymomas as part of the spectrum of thymic epithelial tumours, with low-risk thymomas at one end and thymic carcinomas at the other. There are different classification systems, however, here in the blue table we have the WHO classification. 
Although this correlates with survival rates, there is some controversy about it, as there is some evidence that lacks inter and intra observer reproducibility and clinical predictive value. Also, several types often coexist in the same tumour, making classification difficult. A more simplified system could be seen on the right, graded into low risk and high risk thymomas, as well as thymic carcinoma. Now, there is some work that has been done to try and differentiate between these groups on the basis of CT findings, which we will come on to. Rather than histology, management of thymoma is based more on staging on radiology. The most commonly used system is the Masaoka Koga system, which correlates with survival rates and helps to dictate management decisions. In stage one, the lesion is fully encapsulated, the so-called non-invasive thymoma. On CT, we see this as a well-defined lesion with a smooth contour. On stage two, there is transcapsular spread, either microscopically, difficult to see on CT, or macroscopically with invasion into surrounding mediastinal fat. There is some evidence to suggest that an irregular contour as seen here can suggest capsular invasion. In stage three, there is invasion into neighboring organs or great vessels, and by stage four, there is dissemination. In stage four A, spread to pleura or pericardium. In stage four B, there is nodal disease or hematogenous spread to other organs. Important point here is thymic epithelial tumors like spreading to the pleura and pericardium. So it's really important to interrogate these whenever you have an anterior mediastinal mass. It's why the optimal phase of contrast is a venous phase when looking for spread of thymic epithelial tumors on CT. With regards to treatment, complete surgical resection is recommended for all but stage 4B. Post-op radiotherapy may be offered if there's incomplete resection, and importantly, stages 3 and 4 may be offered neoadjuvant chemotherapy beforehand. So the learning point here is that it's really important as a radiologist to distinguish between stages 1 and 2 versus stages 3 and 4, as it can have implications on whether the patient has neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Let's move on to another case. Here we can see a chest x-ray of a 40-year-old male, and this time there's a clear lesion here at the left hilum. Again, see how you can see hyla vessels through the lesion, suggesting that we have an anterior mediastinal mass. CT confirms this with a lobulated, slightly heterogeneous mass with some cystic areas that we can see laterally here. So from our learning point before, a slightly heterogeneous mass in a patient over 40 is statistically most likely to be a thymoma. Important then to assess the pleura, which is okay, and also to have a look at the pericardium as well. Here we just have a trace of pericardial fluid, but no pericardial nodules. This patient had a successful thymectomy and was also diagnosed with myasthenia gravis. Important point here is that 50% of thymoma patients develop myasthenia gravis. Now, 15% of myasthenia patients overall have a thymoma, and up to 60% of myasthenia patients have thymic hyperplasia. We've already said these patients are usually screened for thymic abnormalities, and there's some debate about the role of having a thymectomy in myasthenia patients. There's some evidence that a thymectomy may be beneficial for symptoms, even for those myasthenia patients without a thymoma. Here we have another case. This time we can see diffuse nodular pleural thickening on the right. This is also confluent with anterior mediastinal mass here. There's some heterogeneity in the contrast enhancement. The differential here is between a primary mesothelioma versus metastatic pleural disease from a separate primary. A clue here is if we go down to the pericardium, we can see that there is an enhancing pericardial nodule. We need to remember that thymomas and thymic epithelial tumors like spreading to pleura and pericardium. This turned out to be an invasive thymoma with spread to the pericardium pleura, so it's stage 4a by the Masaoka Koga staging system. So is there any way to differentiate between a low-risk thymoma versus a high-risk thymoma and thymic carcinomas on CT? There's evidence to support all of the following. Finding that there's a lobulated or irregular contour rather than smooth, heterogeneous rather than homogeneous enhancement, necrosis and fluid density, pleural or pericardial effusion and nodules, lymph node enlargement as well. These are all things I try and include in a report for anterior mediastinal mass. And as I said, and I referred to earlier, the bottom three in particular are really important as parts of this can change the staging to three or four, which can affect the management.
Interesting that calcification on its own isn't a big discriminator, but there is some evidence to suggest that heterogeneous calcification can point towards a more high-risk thymoma. When it comes to anterior mediastinal lesions as a whole, it's important to realise that calcification on its own can't distinguish between benign and malignant disease and can be seen in both. It's important to know about local invasions for purposes of staging and also for surgical planning. Sometimes an ECG gated CT can help. In this case, it's helped to visualise the course of one of the coronary arteries, the ramus intermedius, through a thymoma, which was difficult to assess on a non-gated CT. Before we leave the topic of thymomas, I just want to emphasise that although they can be very slow growing, all thymomas have the potential to metastasize. Some are at higher risk than others. Unless there's been hematogenous or lymph node spread already, it's really important to know that they should all be treated radically. Radical treatment is not necessary for the two other main pathologies that affect the thymus, one, thymic hyperplasia, and two, thymic cysts, which leads us on to the question, how do we differentiate between thymic epithelial tumours and the other thymic lesions, as the management is very different? Now, this is where MRI comes into its own. First, we'll have a look at thymic hyperplasia. So this can take two forms. Firstly, in true thymic hyperplasia, the thymus preserves its macroscopic features, but increases in size. It can be idiopathic or related to recent stress, such as chemotherapy or steroids. In lymphoid hyperplasia, there is lymphocytic infiltration. This can be associated with autoimmune conditions such as myasthenia and connective tissue disease. Classically on CT, in thymic hyperplasia, the thymus will retain its triangular shape and may have a nodular appearance. However, there can be more atypical cases where the thymus can appear oval or appear as a more focal mass, and this can make differentiation from a thymoma sometimes tricky. This is where chemical shift MRI comes into its own. By looking for intralipid content, this method has been shown to be effective for differentiating thymic hyperplasia from thymoma. Here we have a case where there was a nodular triangular lesion on CT suspected to be thymic hyperplasia. So the patient went on to have an MRI. We have the in-phase image on the left and the outer phase image on the right, which you can recognize by the India ink artifact outlining the mediastinal structures. There is loss of signal on the outer phase image, confirming intralipid content and thymic hyperplasia. If it wasn't so clear subjectively, there are equations we can use, such as the chemical shift ratio, to try and be more certain. Contrast that with this case of a thymoma. Here we have a lobulated lesion which has not lost signal on the outer phase images. We cannot confirm intralipid content, and we cannot say for sure that this is thymic hyperplasia. This turned out to be a thymoma. Moving on, here we have a case of a well-defined round lesion in the prevascular space. It's not triangular, so we can put normal thymus and thymic hyperplasia to one side. When we measure the density of the lesion, this has a Hounsfield unit of a fluid density between 0 and 20, so it's in keeping with a simple cyst. Given this appears very homogeneous on CT, this most likely represents a thymic cyst. If there is any doubt, an MRI can exclude enhancing soft tissue, which you may see with the cystic thymoma, which is the main differential. It's not always as straightforward as the last case. In this case, we have an incidental lesion in a female in her 60s with a triangular morphology. It's predominantly smooth contour with a small amount of lobulation on the left side, as we can see here. Its homogeneous and well-defined nature means a thymoma is possible, although it's very triangular, suggesting benign pathology such as a cyst. However, its Hounsfield unit is between 50 and 60. Let's have a look at the MRI scan. The STIR sequence shows its high signal, but completely homogeneous. We have a non-contrast phase here, and then we have a post-contrast phase in which we can see some artefacts, but no convincing enhancing soft tissue within the lesion, which was now suspected to be a benign cyst. The lesion slightly grew on interval imaging, and the patient opted in this case to have it resected, and a benign cyst was confirmed. So here, MRI is key in making the diagnosis by excluding the presence of enhancing soft tissue. Here are four situations where MRI is really useful in the assessment of prevascular mass. Firstly, as we've seen when assessing for thymic hyperplasia by doing in and out of phase sequences, assessing for assist by excluding enhancement on post-contrast sequences, 
Although CT has excellent spatial resolution, and in the case of ECG gating, temporal resolution, MRI can be complementary in terms of its contrast resolution when it comes to assessing tumour planes for staging and surgical planning. Also, if a patient has significant allergy to contrast with CT, MRI is also an alternative. Moving on to lymphoma. There are many occasions where a diagnosis of lymphoma is screaming out as there are enlarged nodes above and below the diaphragm or an enlarged spleen. It can be more tricky, however, if there is a single prevascular lesion in the mediastinum and either no nodes or a small number of nodes only. These can be really difficult to differentiate from a thymic epithelial tumour. In terms of how these present, it really depends on the type. The most common primary mediastinal lymphomas are Hodgkin's of nodular sclerosing type and large B-cell lymphoma. In many cases, the patient may have relatively mild symptoms. However, in others, there may be a rapid onset. If there is fast onset with a pleural effusion and a large mass, consider lymphoblastic non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. In these cases, blood tests can help with a high LDH, and the full diagnosis can potentially be made with cytology from bone marrow. In lymphoma, most lymphoma cases, however, a core biopsy is usually needed. On CT, a small number of cases can present with a single mass similar to the image here, but in other cases, we may see multiple matted nodes that encase rather than invade vessels. All cases of suspected lymphoma usually require a PET for staging, and this can also help guide a biopsy attempt. With lymphoma, PET is key in staging and has a higher sensitivity in CT. It can help in terms of differentiating lymphoma from other causes, as a significant amount of active nodal disease will point more towards lymphoma. Outside of lymphoma, PET doesn't really have an established role in the workup of anterior mediastinal lesions, and it's performed to varying degrees in different institutions. There is some evidence that higher risk thymomas and carcinomas will show increased metabolic activity, but its use is by no means routine. It can sometimes be used as a problem-solving tool. For example, a suspected cysts with equivocal features of MRI showing no avidity on PET can offer more reassurance. Our next case shows a mediastinal mass that has characteristic features on CT. Now, this isn't strictly prevascular. In this case, we can see extension, though, of the thyroid gland all the way from the neck into the mediastinum. The communication with the thyroid gland might not always be clear, and the key here is to look for similarly enhancing tissue to the thyroid, possibly with cystic areas of calcification as you would with any thyroid goiter. With our next case, we see a well-defined prevascular mass with a fat fluid level and fat density anteriorly. The fat fluid level in particular is virtually diagnostic of a benign teratoma, which forms part of a family of tumours, the germ cell tumours, which we'll have a closer look at. As a whole, these are more common in patients under the age of 40. The most common extragonadal site is the anterior mediastinum. The nine teratomas account for about three quarters of mediastinal germ cell tumours, usually an asymptomatic incidental finding, but there can be symptoms due to pressure effects. Rarely, they can rupture into the pleural or pericardial space. With teratomas, we are looking for fat content, but it's important to realise that the absence of fat doesn't exclude a teratoma. We may also see calcification, and rarely just as in the pelvis, a tooth or a bone. The other germ cell tumours have less characteristic findings. Seminomas are more nonspecific, but the presence of a large prevascular mass with lung metastases in a patient under 40 should raise your suspicions. There may be a raised beta HDG, but alpha theta protein is usually normal. Lymphoma is the main differential here, and biopsy is usually needed to tell the difference. Other non seminomatous germ cell tumours are also fairly nonspecific, but usually quite heterogeneous. There again could be lung metastases. The giveaway with this group is a very raised alpha theta protein or beta HCG. So for any heterogeneous prevascular mass in an under 40, checking these blood tests can provide the answer. Next case here, again, we have another prevascular mass, this time with a lot of fat density. So we're thinking about teratoma. There's also soft tissue and fluid components. And at the level of the heart, we can see there is a significant pericardial effusion. This is a biopsy confirmed immature teratoma, which is thought to have ruptured given the presence of a significant pericardial effusion. Although a fat fluid level is fairly specific, just the presence of fat alone in anterior mediastinal mass doesn't definitely mean it's a teratoma, as there are a collection of rarer fat containing lesions that can affect the prevascular space. Here we're talking about thymolipoma, 
lipoma and liposarcoma. In this case, we've got a massive prevascular mass, which extends all the way down into the left cardiophrenic angle. This is predominantly fat density with rather than the small areas of fat density that we get in a teratoma. Here we've got soft tissue strands within it. This is a surgically proven thymolipoma. In the next case, this isn't a technically a prevascular lesion, but I wanted to show you an example of a liposarcoma, another fat-containing mediastinal lesion. There is more soft tissue density within this than you expect within a simple lipoma, which tends to be homogeneous on CT and MRI. It's worth noting that higher grade lesions may be predominantly soft tissue with very little fat density. Which brings us on to our last question. Is biopsy always necessary for all anterior mediastinal lesions? Hopefully you will have gathered from the presentation that prevascular masses are a really diverse group of lesions. And so the approach is fairly nuanced and it's difficult to have a one size fits all approach. Invariably, all of these lesions will either have a CT either directly or as a result of an abnormal chest X-ray. There are then four places we can go, either straight for surgical resection, for surveillance imaging if we think the lesion is potentially benign, or for other imaging such as MRI or PET or biopsy. As well as the appearances on radiology, what helps the guide management is the age and gender of the patient, as well as their clinical presentation. Here we have a chart of the proportion of each of the anterior mediastinal masses we can expect to find in each age group and gender. Firstly, we have the over 40s, and we can see the thymomas and thyroid lesions dominate with only a small proportion of cases attributed to lymphoma or germ cell tumor. Remember that thymomas are usually asymptomatic, so as we said before, an incidental pickup of a prevascular lesion in an over 40 patient is statistically most likely to be a thymoma, even though overall these are relatively uncommon. Completely different picture in the under 40s. And you can see now it becomes a lot more difficult to differentiate between the main causes, with germ cell tumors and lymphomas taking up a bigger proportion of the lesions that we see. Notice how non seminotus germ cell tumors form a significant proportion in males, particularly in their 20s. So getting those tumor markers off can really help. And that's something we can help to remind the clinician of if we see a large heterogeneous mass and possibly lung metastases on a CT. A rapid onset of symptoms in this age group should make you consider a non seminomatous germ cell tumor or lymphoma rather than a thymoma, which are usually relatively asymptomatic. So times where you may not need to go for a biopsy, either radiologically or surgically, include seeing obvious thyroid features on CT, seeing something that looks like a thymoma in a patient with myasthenia gravis or is over 40, having raised alpha theta protein or beta HCG under the age of 40, particularly if the mass is heterogeneous and there are lung metastases, or if we've proven thymic hyperplasia or, C or cyst formation on an MRI. So going forward, five takeaways. Firstly, thymomas are slow growing, but have the potential to metastasize, so ideally should be resected. Secondly, MRI is king when it comes to assessing thymic hyperplasia in cysts. As we said before, a homogeneous or slightly heterogeneous prevascular mass above the age of 40 is likely a thymoma. Venous phase CT helps stage thymic epithelial tumors, interrogate the pleura and pericardium, as this is where these like to spread to. Suspected lymphoma needs PET CT for staging and tissue biopsy. Well done for making it this far. I hope you found the talk helpful. And the next time you come across a prevascular mass on the X-ray or CT, hopefully you'll feel a little more confident. Thanks again to Radiopedia and thank you all very much.